I guess we could go ahead. <laughs> so uh, thank you to um, everyone who's joined. Um, uh, so I am stepping in for uh, Dr. Rebek today uh, because he had a, a family emergency and he's not gonna be able to join. Um, but um, I will just introduce our uh, panelists. So we have um, uh, Rebecca Vanderwall, um, who was the one who uh, gave the lecture that you listened to. Uh, she's a genetic counselor. We also have uh, Diane Kohler, uh, who had given a prior lecture, who's also a genetic counselor. And um, uh, Dr. Ashil Man Manura Keza, uh, who is a, 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 a clinical oncologist in Rwanda. Uh, so we'll open it up uh, so folks can, you know, type questions in the uh, in the chat um, and. Um, uh, and uh, as folks join, uh, just um, you know, type your questions. Uh, there are no specific questions yet, um, but um, I can start with um, uh, a question from yesterday. Um, I think that was a question that um, uh, you didn't get a chance to discuss yesterday, so we can start from there. Uh, so at the end of the discussion yesterday, we were uh, talking about um, different uh, practices um, uh, or different um, settings of the practice of genetic counseling. Um, and um, one of the questions I had for the panelists was, how do you approach things differently or how do other places approach things differently? So um, I know the counselors on the call have worked in large academic centers, uh, but if based on their experiences, how do smaller community centers or other places that might not have as many resources sort of approach genetic counseling? So we can start from there. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, okay. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think that then the context that we were talking about was kind of under the idea that we've known for, for a long time, which is there's kind of not enough genetic counselors for the demand of genetic testing. And that's unfortunately been true for a very long time, but continues to be true as more and more people are eligible or good candidates to have genetic testing. So large academic centers have um, often many genetic counselors, but that's not always true at community centers. It's not always true across even the United States um, and, and of course elsewhere abroad as well. So some of the things that have started to happen to help kind of make sure that people who need genetic testing get access are that there's kind of training like this short course basically of people who are not genetic counselors on how to do this, how to think about the appropriate genetic testing, who is appropriate for genetic testing. Um, and, and hopefully clinicians can use resources like reaching out to someone from the National Society of Genetic Counselors, like reaching out to someone from the genetic testing lab, because usually labs are hiring and using genetic counselors who can answer clinicians' questions about testing before it's ordered. Um, and then referring out potentially on the back end. So after a genetic order by a provider who's not a genetic counselor, if there are more questions or if there's a positive result and they need to be followed and that provider is not comfortable with it, um, genetic counselor's time will be more open because they're not seeing people pre-test anymore and then they can potentially follow um, post-test if available to, to help with that kind of screening and management for those who are positive. Um, there's also a lot of places, including Dana Farber, who have worked on do, making videos to help uh, give patients informed consent or genetics education without seeing a genetic counselor in person. Um, there's chatbots. There's a lot of innovative use of technology to kind of try to help support anyone who finds that their patient is appropriate for genetic testing but can't access a genetic counselor. Um, Diane, what else am I missing? I think you did a really good job summarizing all of that. Um, and I think I would just add, I think probably the most important thing that we've noticed from the community centers that we work with that don't necessarily have, you know, the patient volume for a full-time genetic counselor or the ability to have a genetic counselor is to 
you know, have a connection to maybe a genetic counselor at a larger academic institution who can be there to, like Becca was saying, to help advise on challenging cases or to help think things through while not necessarily providing all the genetic counseling. Um, they can be there as a resource for those challenging cases that might come up. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions yet um, in the box. So if folks have questions, please feel free to, to ask them. Um, one question that I will ask, um, which was uh, covered in the, uh, the case studies. So, um, and we, you talked about this a little bit um, uh, yesterday, but it was towards the end, um, Rebecca sort of um, how to approach patients who have uh, variants of unknown significance um, um, and just, um, uh, you know, giving us a little bit of a refresher on that um, um, because that's something that um, uh, we'll probably be encountering more um, in settings um, like uh, countries in Africa. So just a, a quick refresher on how do we think about these patients and what should we do? Diane, do you want to start on this one since it was my my explanation that's on the video? Sometimes it's really hear this <laughs> different perspective. <laughs> sure. Um, so with variants of uncertain significance, um, typically we kind of treat them clinically like negatives. Uh, we take the innocent until proven guilty approach most of the time is what we say, because uh, we know that most of the time these are benign, normal differences in the DNA, not things that are increasing cancer risk or stopping that gene's ability to function. Um, we've seen from the data that's been reported by the labs, about 90% of these that get reclassified are eventually reclassified as benign or likely benign. So we call those downgrades. Um, that does mean that 10% eventually get upgraded to pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants. Um, so I think we do always kind of keep an eye on these VUSs. Um, often we will reference ClinVar, uh, which is a public database to try to see if other labs are also classifying it as a VUS or if there's maybe a different clinical lab that's classifying it as pathogenic, um, in which case we might be more inclined to treat it as pathogenic. So there are exceptions to every rule Rule. Um, and there are a small handful of patients with VUSs that we treat as if they're pathogenic, um, but usually we need pretty convincing evidence to do that, um, normally meaning another lab has classified it as pathogenic or there's something in the tumor genomics that's making us very suspicious that it might be pathogenic um, because we know typically if you're treating a VUS like a positive result, you could do more harm than good. Um, I think all of us have seen stories in the news and such about women who have bilateral mastectomies and then we find out later that that wasn't necessary and it was really a benign finding in the gene, but it was somebody acting on a VUS. So that's really what we're trying to avoid with our approach. I think it's definitely always going to be important in settings like genetic testing in Africa as well to take that really close look because Dio, like you kind of implied, um, unfortunately, most data that's used for, um, you know, our big databases to look at these variants and to help uh, the labs decide whether they're pathogenic or harmful versus benign um, is data from like European populations. And so we have less data about variants that are in different populations around the world. And you know, I hope that that continues to change and evolve, but it does mean that we're more likely to get uncertain results when testing a population that there's less data about in the big databases that are used. Um, and so I think that it's just important to take those close looks, to check in places like ClinVar, to kind of ask the lab questions about, has this been seen at your lab before? Where, when was there a family history? Um, to really try to get as much data as we can, both for that individual patient and to continue to kind of increase the database of more diverse populations in genetics. Yeah, thank you both. Um, so there's a question here, um, which is um, alluding to um, uh, some uh, specific cultural factors or stigma around um, cancer um, and some um, fatalistic attitudes like, you know, um, cancer is something that is predetermined 
um, and um, uh, the fact that uh, you know perhaps there's nothing that can really be done when someone has cancer. Um, so maybe this is more a question for Ashiel: is um, how do you um, um, how do you approach that, especially now that um, uh, we're going to be thrown in, into the mix, something like genetic testing? Uh, do you feel like something like this could potentially be helpful? Um, um, in helping people um, reassess some of these um, beliefs and stigma? Absolutely. Um, the idea here is, uh, as we've seen over, over the course of the sessions and, and, and even before, the knowledge that is known is that most of the cancers, whether it's somatic or germline, uh, there are always mutations behind them. Um, some people might be predisposed, be given the family history, and uh, it's something that we see very often that people would be, you know, asking themselves questions. Is it God that punished people? Is it, is it that there is some other unknown um, uh, factors that lead into it? And we've seen mostly with patients with the cervical cancer, um, as it is the most common here, and, and many others. Um, but the good thing with genetics, uh, genetic testing in general, is that it's going to provide solutions in terms of uh, getting that added knowledge on, on the predisposing factors to cancers. It doesn't have to be some unknown factors. It, does, it doesn't have to be some mystic um, factors behind, behind uh, what we see. There is scientific background to, um, to cancer uh, development, pretty much. So... Uh, it, it has a, the, the study that we'll have to, to do here has a huge impact and a lot of public awareness, in, uh, in, uh, you know, influence in, in how we approach cancers in general in the communities. Yeah, if I, if I could just add, I, I, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, the more education and, and concepts around, um, you know, screening and earlier detection um, because you know unfortunately it was in fact the case and true for a long time that patients were getting diagnosed at very late stages and those patients were certainly dying from their cancer um, but um, with uh, earlier detection or um, identification of um, high-risk individuals who can get potential screening um, and um, that, that certainly can help um, in um, uh, some of these um, uh, attitudes, which you know, are not necessarily irrational attitudes because um, these were, that, this was the reality for a long time. Um, so there's another question, um, which is um, uh, sort of talking about um, perhaps the intersection of the environment and genes. Um, so, in this particular question, it's about uh, oral squamous um, cell carcinoma, uh, which um, uh, there's a high incidence of this in Sudan, um, which is associated with um, uh, chewing a specific type of tobacco. Uh, but um, also just um, asking, you know, are there particular instances in which um, a genetic condition can put you at, at higher risk based on an environmental exposure. Um, so um, I don't know if um, uh, uh, Diane or uh, Becca can um, um, start with answering these. I think that's an area that there's definitely a lot of interest in, and we know that there are certain gene environment interactions that exist, uh, but it's not something that has really made its way into our clinical practice a lot yet. I think so far where we've really come with genetic testing and genetic counseling is mostly these kind of Mendelian genetic disorders where there's a clear association between an inherited gene mutation and a disease risk. Um, and we certainly appreciate that the environment plays a role, but I think um, we haven't really, at least in the clinical space, gotten to a lot of specific testing for genes that might be specifically influenced by the environment. Um, you know, sometimes if we know someone has uh, an inherited risk for colorectal cancer, for instance, we might encourage certain like dietary guidelines to try to reduce the risk of colorectal cancer. Um, and, you know, certainly we encourage people or we discourage smoking, chewing tobacco because we know of the associated cancer risks, um, but that's not necessarily based on certain gene mutations. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Becca. 
Um, I think I'll just, because we're kind of be recording, uh, it's not the exact answer to this, but just want to throw out kind of the behind the two hit hypothesis when we think of somatic versus germline uh, cancer. So just kind of the foundation of all of this is that we all have two copies of every single one of our genes, one from mom and one from dad. When we're thinking about cancer risk, we're thinking about the specific genes that are typically there to help stop cancers from forming or basically to, to help make sure that our cells don't grow out of control into a cancer or a tumor. And there's, there's different ways that cancers can form, right? For most people, they're not born with any difference in their genes. Both of their genes are functioning the way that they, we expect. And what happens is at some point throughout the lifetime, either because of random events or because of environmental or lifestyle exposures, um, some of the genes or the genes in just some of your cells might develop a mutation. And then the gene stops working as well as we expect. And the kind of basic classic idea behind when cancer develops is when both copies of the same gene randomly or because of environment exposure end up both being mutated. So now you have neither functioning copy of that gene. And so a tumor can develop. The cell can grow out of control because the gene can't be as protective as we expect. So for hereditary risk, what happens is a person is already born with one of their two copies of the gene mutated. And so it takes less time or there's fewer things that have to happen before that random other mutation occurs within the cell in that same gene, because you're already born with one mutation instead of having to wait for two to happen. Um, so the idea behind that is there definitely could be an interaction between already having hereditary risk and then having more environmental exposures or more lifestyle exposures that make it more likely that that second mutation will happen. Um, but I don't think that we have the, the details, like Diane said, about exactly when that occurs, exactly what genes, you know, exactly how those random kind of mutations happen within the lifetime or because of environment. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a, a great explanation. Um, uh, now we'll move on to a question, um, which is uh, specifically about um, cancer genetics education in Africa. Um, I think this is a tough one. Um, so um, uh, sort of maybe I will turn this over to, um, to Dr. Annette Owenezo, who just uh, joined us. Um, I'll ask you and, um, uh, and Ashil, sort of what are your thoughts on um, how to improve access to cancer genetics education? Um, what are your thoughts on how this could be potentially implemented um, across the health system in, um, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa? You can maybe specifically use Rwanda as an example, but just some thoughts more broadly as well. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, for the Rwandan uh, uh, situations, I think that uh, first of all is to do to set up the facilities, uh, such as, for example, initiating the, the, the laboratory testing, and even though the training, and also to, to get the support from the, uh, the government support. Here, for example, we have the RBC, which is involved in the capacity building in the cancer. So all these will help to improve uh, the access of the population to the cancer services, but also in addition also to make awareness in the population about the existence of cancer genetics tests uh, for the population to access them. Thank you very much. Um, just to add on that, I, I agree with the, what Dr. Annette says, uh, beyond, you know, beyond uh, building infrastructure, that is needed beyond you know all the all the things in terms of support that we need. We also need to generate data. Um, we really can't speak from empty ground from an empty ground in terms of uh, cancer genetics. And also, I, I think I think she alluded that it. She mentioned it yesterday. Um, in the past, we used to have issues of colleagues, doctors who wouldn't even you know uh, recommend a, a parent to go for genetic testing 
for their children if ever they have an issue. So to migrate from that into getting cancer genetic uh, tested, now that would mean that we need to actually bring data. Say, you know, from 400 people that we've tested, we have 10% with uh, something familial that we've seen, and, and it's something that has to be uh, given. Uh, so that data now will have to be implemented and, you know, pretty much followed through all the conundrum. And, and there is no other way we're going to, to educate people without generating the data. Um, I think the very specific question that, that uh, the person asked was about, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the education. Uh, public education has it, you know, any education pretty much has it. You start, you start learning about genetics in high school even in Rwanda, I did it in Burundi as well. But at the end of the day, it really seemed far-fetched. You even study it in medical school, but it's still far-fetched. You, you would know that there's some, some diseases, that some conditions that are developed after uh, something autosomal uh, dominant in the families. But then at the end of the day, it still is not something that you would think of in the first place whenever you have a patient in front of you. So. At the end of the day, uh, data is needed. Uh, showing that we need these things will always, always come from the data, uh, not speaking from, uh, from, from an empty ground, pretty much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think those are really good points. I think certainly the importance of, um, of having data from, um, uh, from these countries in, in, um, in Africa in general, I think, um, certainly can help. Um, and, um, you know, I think one other th um, thing which we've also mentioned previously is um, just um, really thinking um, innovatively about um, uh, what type of strategies could be used for, for education um, I and mean, how to incorporate um, those strategies. Um, so, you know, there is uh, some amount of ed education that happens in medical school, um, and then there's stuff that happens while folks are in training. Um, um, and as you can imagine, it might be challenging if you're practicing in a place where there is no expertise. Um, so it might be hard to get that um, uh, practical education um, on the ground. So I think, uh, you know, an extension or expansion of courses like this one that we're currently doing um, or other form of um, um, online platforms could also um, uh, fill in some of those gaps. Um, so I'll move on to another question. Um, so there's, this is a specific question about um, um, amniocentesis um, and um, uh, um, what, um, uh, what's the role for amniocentesis. Um, so maybe perhaps not specific just for um, uh, cancer genetics per se, um, but sort of thinking about um, the ethics of doing um, uh, genetic testing in embryos prior to prior to birth. Um, I don't know who wants to take that. <laughs> I'd like to. Um, so I've read about amniocentesis in uh, in generally genetic testing, and I. I'll get support from all the knowledgeable people on the panel. Um, it is true that amniocentesis is usually done for most of the, you know, the, the genetic uh, backed conditions. I mean here, Down syndrome, um, you know, anything really, trisomy 18, 21, anything really. But then again, in cancer specifically, you also would want to see uh, a child very, very early. And these are, uh, conditions that have autosomal dominant genes. Um, uh, and my thought really goes to um, the retinoblastoma gene, RB1. Um, if you know in the family, both parents have, you know, an autosomal dom dominant RB1 gene, amniocentesis is usually something to do. Uh, you want to do it because the, uh, retinoblastoma tends to be very, very aggressive at a certain age and also would result many times in, uh, in bilateral retinoblastoma, both eyes, and you wouldn't want a child to, have to lose both eyes from surgery. So if there is a way to screen early that the child could be having a, a, a risk, you'd want to do it very early on in, uh, during amniocentesis. So whether it is uh, ethical, <laughs> it's, a, it's another question. 
uh, because then um, things like when, why, how to do it and how to approach the family is, is another thing that we have to mention here. Um, but I feel like if you uh, approach the family, tell them that they have a risk uh, and that the child has a risk, um, I think there is, there is really no point to worry about the ethics behind it. Yeah. If I could ask um, the genetic counselors to comment. So, because I think there are multiple levels of things to think about, um, um, whether or not to perform a procedure, what's the risk of the actual procedure, um, and then what, what um, possibilities are there of what to do with the results? Um, and also what are the ethics around those options of what to do? Um, so if, if I could hear some thoughts from you guys on, on those points. Okay. Um, so, so I think there's a, there's a lot of things to think about, I guess. Um, but to find some place to start, I think that there's a few different things that people consider when they know that they carry a gene mutation and they're doing family planning. Um, so one thing that some people decide is they know that they would do not want to pass the gene mutation on to their children if it's something that they can access and afford. Some people choose to do, do IVF and PGD or in vitro fertilization. You take the egg and the sperm, create embryos outside of the body and test those embryos using um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, that's that PGD, to choose an embryo to implant back in the woman that does not carry the gene mutation. Um, so that's one option that people have, again, when they can access and afford it, which is slowly becoming more and more possible. Um, another option is testing during pregnancy, so amniocentesis. This is usually something that is done to um, be either really prepared, right, to know ahead of time. So if there is some kind of screening or intervention or management that can happen right away after baby is born to already know if the baby carries the mutation or for some families to consider termination of pregnancy if the mutation is present and they're not willing to move forward with the pregnancy based on that information. Um, and then the last is to wait either until after birth or even much later in the child's life before doing genetic testing, depending on when the risks are known to happen, right? There is there's, um, cancer predispositions or other types of genetic risk that start very young in childhood. So we suggest testing early in life so we know when to start their screening or to start their intervention or management. There's other things like the genes we've mostly been talking about, like the BRCA or BRCA genes, where your risks don't really start until you're 25 at least. And so usually we suggest not even testing until someone turns at least age 18. So that person can choose for themselves whether or not they want to know the information, when they want to know the information, and how they're going to take this information for themselves and their health. Um, so I think that there is a lot of things for parents to consider when they're thinking about those options, when they're thinking about you know, what they can access, when they think about what they would use that information for, and when, and how, and why. And when they think about um, their child's autonomy, right? Are they able to preserve their child's autonomy by waiting until the child can choose for themselves? Or is this something that really affects um, newborns or children before they turn 18, where this is really information that we need to get ahead of time? Um, and, and then there are some risks with amniocentesis, right? There's always any kind of risk with, with something that um, you do during pregnancy or an intervention or a needle, needle in the belly. Um, so people kind of can consider, am I willing to, to take the risk of the amniocentesis to learn this information at this time? Would I do something actionable, actionable about it or can I wait? Um, Diane, what else? I think you covered most of it really well. Um, I think I would just kind of add that I know one thing that I was taught in my genetic counseling training was when thinking about whether you're going to present the option of an amniocentesis, mostly in the context of things like Down syndrome risk, we often use 
the risk for the condition against the risk of miscarriage with amniocentesis. So if the risk of miscarriage with amniocentesis is going to be greater than the risk of the condition you're trying to screen for, like for instance, if you have a 25-year-old pregnant person and they're trying to screen for Down syndrome, the risk of amniocentesis might be higher than the risk for Down syndrome. So in that case, it might be a little less ethical to think about amniocentesis in that scenario. Um, and I think it's also challenging when we're thinking particularly about these adult onset cancer genetic conditions, because we do have a lot of parents who just kind of want to know whether their child is going to have the condition or not. Um, and I think it can put us as clinicians in a challenging position because we want to protect the child's autonomy, their right not to know their genetic status necessarily. Um, so you really need to have that careful conversation with the parents about like, would this actually change outcomes of your pregnancy? which who knows until they're faced with that scenario as well. It's hard for them to predict what they might do. Um, so it can definitely be a really challenging conversation when we're in the realm of adult onset conditions. I would say that's a little more ethically murky right now compared to when we're talking about childhood onset conditions, things that require very early intervention in life. Yeah, I think you both covered some very important points uh, and considerations. Um, uh, uh, when it comes to um, this type of testing. Um, so there is a more general question about um, uh, public education, civic education around um, uh, genetic um, testing or genetics in general. Um, so um, I don't know if any of you want to sort of reflect on, you know, how to, um, uh, I think um, Fareed on prior lectures that talked a little bit about some advocacy or the role of um, uh, genetic counselors in advocacy. So I don't know if you guys want to reflect on, on that. I mean, I think um, at least within the U.S. and in the cancer space, one of the things that kind of helped with public education a lot, really the first step was just helping with cancer awareness in general, making the public more comfortable talking about things like breast cancer, gynecologic cancers, things that used to be really taboo. Because I think we know one challenge in all settings is family history collection. And if in you know your culture, your community, people aren't really likely to share that they have certain types of cancer diagnoses or cancer diagnosis at all, if it's very kind of stigmatized or taboo, you're going to have a really hard time getting any step past that, really getting to know who's at risk, to know who should benefit from genetic testing. So I think, um, you know, the first big step that's been helpful within the U.S. context is getting people to talk more about their cancer diagnoses, sharing it with their family members so that people were aware of if they even were at high risk for genetics. Um, and then I think on the genetic piece, another thing that's been really helpful in the U.S. context is honestly like celebrity endorsements. We call it the Angelina Jolie effect when Angelina Jolie went public that she had a BRCA mutation. Suddenly everybody was super aware of BRCA, was talking with their family about these things. And we saw a huge increase in people seeking genetic testing. Yeah, those are certainly really good points. Yeah. So how, um, so just public education about cancer in general or public awareness about cancer in general. Um, um, so I guess I'll ask a question to the to the attendees, and if you can just you know type in um, responses. Um, I'm just trying to get a sense of you know what are the most important things you feel like you've learned from this uh, short course so far over the past um, uh, couple of weeks. Um, so if you could just type in you know just one word responses or sentence responses um, um, in the um, question for the, for the panelists. Um, so, you know, I guess, where do we go from here? I guess, <laughs> if we could ask that question. So, you know, based on what we've done for, um, in the short course, um, uh, sort of maybe, you know, um, we talked a little bit about this before, um, with regards to, you know, how can people say further some knowledge um, in this area? Um, uh, was it just some recommendations? I think you can sort of give the group um, um, in um, how they can use this information or how they could potentially collaborate and things of that nature. 
Um, yeah, I, I think that in terms of furthering education, um, uh, obviously there's there's quite a bit of literature on cancer genetics out there, scientific literature. So even just looking up um, your favorite journals or looking up PubMed and kind of searching, you'll see um, a whole bunch of information if you want to do further reading. Um, some good resources that I think we've talked about uh, a couple times, the National Society of Genetic Counselors, um, they have some further information about genetic counseling specifically, and there's a journal of genetic counseling um, that's published. Uh, in terms of if you're looking for those specific recommendations for who to test and then what to do for when people test positive, we often use the National Comprehensive Cancer Network or NCCN. Um, Diane, any other like educational resources that you can think of? I think those are the main ones. The ones that we use the most really are those NCCN guidelines to help us know how to triage people um, and NSGC's resources. Um, but yeah, and I also think, you know, if you were trying to think about how to incorporate some of this, I mean, it makes sense to think about in your own practice or your own clinical space, you know, is there an opportunity to ask people about family history? You know, how could in your clinic space you start to think about offering genetic testing, um, looking into lab options, things like that, see how this would really fit in your context if it would be possible. Yeah, I definitely think family history can be a place to start if it feels difficult to just go straight into trying to figure out how to order genetic testing. Step one is, is really even just starting to kind of encourage patients to learn about as much of their family history as they can knowing that there's lots of barriers to that. Um, but potentially a start is just thinking about um, people who are high risk based on their family history alone, right? We think about screening individuals more often if they have a strong family history, no matter what their genetic testing results are. So that's kind of maybe a first step towards this idea of familial risk or preventative care. Um, and then of course it's, it's the big step to try to figure out what labs might be accessible and who to work with to really start doing genetic testing or thinking about moving forward with genetic testing in your clinic. Yeah, and you never know how just asking the question about family history could really spark those conversations within families. I think we see this all the time where it's not until we ask like, oh, did that cousin ever have cancer? And they're like, you know what, I'm gonna go ask them. And then they can, you know, maybe next time we see them follow up and be like, oh, you know, I talked to my aunt about this and I learned this new thing. So um, if they've never asked before or never knew it was something important, you never know how even asking the question could spark conversations. And Flip side of that, potentially encouraging patients that you see who have been diagnosed with cancer or any other kind of major condition to encourage them to be open to their family members about it. Um, I think that that's, you know, another barrier is that idea of this being taboo or something that you're not supposed to talk about or tell people about. Um, and I think that we all can play a role in advocating for our patients to feel comfortable opening up to their family members because it can affect their family members' risk, right? This can be important for your children to know because it can affect what their risks are, potentially how they're followed in the future. Um, so I think that that's another way to try to open this up so then future generations will know that information because it um, maybe wasn't kept as secret as, as it sometimes classically is. Yeah. Yeah, so those are, those are certainly very good points. I think, you know, um, absolutely starting from where you are, which is being able to take a good family history. And, you know, as with anything, um, the more you do something, the more the better you get at it, um, and the more routine it becomes for you and also for, for the patients. So I think that those are really good, um, uh, good points. Um, so P we'll sort of review what people are saying for what things that they've learned. Um, but before that, there's a question about, um, you know, so how do you sort of balance, since, since um, uh, there are multiple ideologies of cancers um, and cancers can be, you know, sporadic, they can be based on um, uh, environmental or other types of exposure or genetic conditions, you know, how do you sort of like balance that in educational, um, in public education or how, how should people approach that in public education? 
Yeah, I think it's it's really important to remember that because I think in the world of genetics, we forget all the time. We see lots of patients who have hereditary predispositions, which in our mind makes us feel like it's more common than it is um, because we just happen to be seeing, especially in our center, all of these kind of rare people at once. And so I think for patients, it's really important to emphasize when first seeing them, if they have negative results, that, that that's the most common finding. Most of the time, we're not going to identify a hereditary cause behind cancer. Um, and that's especially helpful to do within a risk assessment. After asking about family history, if someone knows all about their family and they know that they're you know, 80 something years old and the first person in the family to be diagnosed with prostate cancer and there's not really any other cancers in the family and everyone in their family lived to an older age, you can emphasize that the likelihood that their prostate cancer is because of one of these gene mutations that we've been talking about is quite low. Um, you know, the people that are most likely to have a hereditary predisposition have the features of it that we've been talking about. It's not true 100% of the time, which is why more and more people are good candidates for genetic testing. Um, but, but it is true a lot of the time that we can make a relatively good assessment of who is actually going to have this hereditary cause behind their cancer up front when we know enough about their personal and family history. Um, so I think we really do try to emphasize both pre and post genetic tests with patients um, that that most of the time we're not going to find a hereditary cause behind their diagnosis. And there's, it might be because there's still something that we need to learn in the future. There's hereditary risks that we haven't learned about, but it might just be because there is one of the cancers that's sporadic or environmental, et cetera. Um, that's, thank you, that's great. Um, so just uh, reflecting on what folks are typing in here. So looks like um, uh, there's been a lot of knowledge gain with regards to just uh, the capacity of uh, genetic testing and um, also things around um, the importance of genetics, genetic counseling. Um, and um, you know, I think we've been able to engender some excitement that um, you know, this is something that um, might not necessarily be completely um, unattainable anymore. Um, and perhaps there might be some innovative and ways to start to think about implementing um, uh, genetic testing in an African context. Um, and uh, there's also a comment, I particularly like this comment, is like being able to detect a loaded gun um, um, so that you can actually do something about it. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's important, yeah, because people might have risks that they don't know about. And um, this is one way of potentially mitigating, uh, mitigating those risks. Um, so I don't see any other um, specific questions. So if there are any specific questions people have, uh, you know, feel free to type in those questions as we sort of get closer to the end. Um, so, you know, this has certainly been um, a very educational session, and I think it's also been quite enlightening for all of us on the panel as well. Um, I think um, um, it's been good to learn um, from the experiences of um, other people and also learn from, you know, the questions and the concerns um, folks have. Um, so, you know, all the material for the course is going to be available um, um, online. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we are going to be giving out um, participation um, certific certificates, um, uh, but at the end of the course, um, probably tomorrow morning, uh, there will be a, a post-course survey, um, similar to the pre-course survey that um, uh, many of you had taken. Um, and at the end of the post-course survey, uh, you'll be able to, um, provide your name and email address um, if you would like to get a participation certificate. Um, um, any other questions or any pressing things um, that folks want us to talk about? Okay, so if there isn't um, too much, um, we don't necessarily have to fill the entire hour if there isn't um, much more, I think um, 
um, I can just thank the, the current panelists. Um, uh, so um, uh, Becca van der Waal and Diane Kohler and Ashil uh, Manuel Keza, and also um, all the other panelists uh, for the prior days as well. Um, um, I'm sure Dr. Uh, Rebecca is sad to miss our session today, but um, uh, you know, we thank him for organizing this and pulling all of this together. Um, and there's also somebody else um, on the panel uh, who you can't see, who is um, Carolyn Andrews. Um, I'll put you on the spot, Carolyn, um, if you <laughs> want to turn on your video. Or, um, but Carolyn has sort of been the um, behind the scenes organizer for all of this. So let's also thank her for uh, pulling all of this together. Um, thank you very much, Carolyn. Thank you. Yeah. And also, um, you know, to Ashil and the Rwanda team for the, um, uh, you know, motivating us to do this um, and uh, uh, for the upcoming uh, project that will be happening in Rwanda. So if, without further ado, I think we can probably call it a day. So thank you everyone. <laughs>